Hello everyone. So today's lecture is on the blast wave analogy in hypersonic blunt body flows. So you can see I have a photo of Oppenheimer. Well, this is uh, Killian Murphy who played Oppenheimer in the film. Uh, the real Oppenheimer is here on the left. So he directed the Manhattan Project. But the star of the show today is uh, G.I. Taylor on the right. So he was a physicist and fluid dynamicist at Trinity College, Trinity College, Cambridge. And he famously predicted the energy of the atom bomb that was tested in 1945, the Trinity explosion, um, just from photos. So the photos had timestamps of the explosion happening. So the explosion uh, increasing in, in radius. Uh, so just from those uh, photos, he could come up with a value for the total energy of the bomb within 15%, which is incredible. Um, at that time, especially um, without uh, uh, enough information, because most of the information was classified. So let's see. Let's see the the explosion uh, to get an idea of what we are looking at. So this is a video of the Trinity explosion from 1945. So I'll play that in a second and you'll notice that this white explosion that you can see, it will expand out uh, as we play the video. It's a faster video, but back then they had um, the frame rates uh, required um, to capture something like this, which is quite in incredible in, in itself. So I'll play the video. You can see as time progresses, it expands out fairly quickly. So I'll play it once more. But there you go. So as the explosion takes place with time, we have an increasing radius of that explosion. Now, G.I. Taylor got these four photos. So these photos were published two years after the um, test, so 1947. So uh, these photos were unclassified and obviously they didn't think uh, at that time that this information only, so the progression of the explosion and, and the timestamp there, you can see on each photo on the bottom left you have a timestamp, so no one thought from that you would gain some classified information. But G.I. Taylor did exactly that, and he had an ex excellent um, intuition for fluid mechanics and the physics related to it, of course. So here on the uh, right-hand side, you can see a log plot. So on the x-axis, you have time, and on the y-axis, you have the radius. So but from different um, timestamps, uh, uh, Taylor plotted the uh, radius uh, onto this plot. And we're going to see the details of how he calculated the uh, energy of the bomb now. OK, so let's plot the radius of the explosion versus time so here radius of the explosion versus time qualitatively if we plot the points we'll see as time progresses the points become sparser and they sort of um, become flatter so with time the explosion is slowing down and, but we can see that within this short duration we have a heavily non-linear behavior so when you have a behavior like this, uh, it's quite useful to look at the uh, log plot of the same points. So this is exactly what G.I. Taylor did. So on the x-axis is the 10 base log of time. Similarly, on the y-axis, we have the log scale of the radius. So now if we plot the points, they would be pretty much on a line. G.I. Taylor's data points that he looked at uh, ha ha had an outlier here. But generally speaking, you'd see a line like this. 
So from this line, we can look at the equation. So, so the equation here would be equal to m log of time and some intercept c. So the intercept would be around here. So from here, I can get rid of the log if I wanted to do that. So here I'm placing m as, as the power of t and times 10 to the c1. So I get r equals t times c2. So I'm renaming this part, renaming this part as c2. So 10 to the c1, that's a constant, and c2 would be a constant as well. So over here, I have this relationship for the for the points, the data that we have. So time versus radius. So we have the radius equal to some quantity times time over an exponent of m. Okay, so now um, generally we'll do a full dimension analysis uh, for a problem like this, but uh, G.I. Taylor actually uh, ha had a very good intuition of the problem. So uh, he did something very clever and we'll take sort of that kind of path. So we're not going to go into the details of dimension analysis, um, but kind of look at the problem uh, similar to the way of G.I. Taylor. So if we look at the dimension, dimensions, of the quantities. So first of all, the radius will have the dimension L, which is for length. If we look at time, T over M, so M is some exponent, right? So this would be T M. So T here is for time. It could be in seconds, milliseconds, hours, and so on. And now the question, of course, is what dimension does C2 have? Now, here is where G.I. Taylor really showed his genius. Um, and uh, that's uh, something that he's done over his career many times. He had excellent intuition of the physics and boiled down the maths to much more simpler problems. So we're going to look at what he uh, propose C2 to be, so he placed C2 as the energy over the density. So this is the density, the atmospheric uh, density, and this is the energy of the bomb. So if we look at, say, say if this is the ground, you have the bomb, so boom, the energy traveling outwards, it's an explosion. So if we again look at, if we look at what C2 is, so C2, if C2 increases, the radius would be larger. And if it decreases, the radius would be smaller. So if we have, if we keep the time constant C2, a larger C2 value would give a larger radius. So this means that C2 really determines how big the explosion would be for a given uh, time. So if the energy is pushing outwards, so that's the explosion, there might, must be a counterbalance. So the force or quantity that is working against it would be the density. So that was his intuition, which worked really well. So now we take this quantity here and look at the dimension of that. So here, if we look at the dimension of E, think about the kinetic energy, for example, half 
mass times the velocity squared. So in terms of units, or uh, in this case dimension, it would be m times l squared t to the minus 2. So this is velocity squared, and this is mass. Okay, and then if we look at density, it's kilograms per meter cubed, so it's mass per the volume here. So L to the minus 3, that's the volume. Okay, so if we have this, then we can say that the dimension for C2 would be so this divided by this quantity, so we, we lose m, and then we have l to the 5, and then t to the minus 2. Okay, so let's go to the next page. Okay. So now we had write it down again. So C2 was L to the 5 T minus 2. But if we look at the relationship that we had earlier, that was R C2 Tm. So that means if R, R has the has the dimension of L, so R is L, so we must reduce the exponent here. So C2 in this case must be 1 over 5. So if we do that now, C2, the dimension of C2 would be L T minus 2 over 5. Okay. And if we now compare this part to this part, now we need, if we, if we want to equate this equation, then we need to get rid of t. So m has to be, if we compare the two here, then m has to be 2 over 5. So now, if I look at the whole equation, so I have L on the right hand side, uh, sorry, the left hand side, the right hand side, I have L T minus, so T over minus 2 over 5 times T to the 2 fifths. Okay, so now we can get rid of the, the time dimension and we're left with L. So we have length on the left-hand side, length on the right-hand side. So now the equation that we have is the radius, which is a function of time, equals energy over density 1 over 5, then T 2 over 5. Okay, and there is another constant, s, which is a function of gamma, the isentropic exponent. That's something that was added to this equation. For the purpose of this course, we are not going to look at how it's derived, but essentially this, this quantity here is a function of gamma and we're not we're not going to derive this here in in, in this course but I'll give you a, a few a, a few um, um, a few values for for this uh, constant here so if we if we look at the energy so if we rearrange to look at the energy we'll have e equals rho naught r to the 5 and then t 
to the power of minus 2. And here I'll have k, which is a function of gamma. Now, k here is, so this is the energy. Now, k in this case is just 1 over s to the power of 5. Okay, so for, for reasonable, um, reasonable values of gamma for air, so around if we have gamma equal 1.4 and reasonable values, so that could be, for example, when we when we have a, a gamma that changes with uh, temperature, it will reduce and, and and any reasonable amount of gamma for air. So here we'll say air K would be about within a range of 0 0.8 to 1.2. And we can approximate, so for air with gamma 1.4 and around the same value, so even, even if it's 1.3, 1.25, for example, k equals 1 is a good first approximation. Okay? So let's look at what we can do with this. So a few things to note here. We're going to connect this to the hypersonic problem that we looked at. But before we do that, let's look at the problem a little closer. So we're not going to derive K or S, but let's look at where it can come from. So if we look at the explosion again. So this is the ground, you have the explosion. So if we plot, say, in a P versus distance, so if I take a probe here and then go in this direction, essentially in distance, and another say measurement here, then as I go here, and I, if I keep taking measurements, then I'll have a high pressure. And then as I go out of this explosion, it will drop suddenly. It's a drastic drop, and it will keep going. So this would be the at atmospheric pressure. So this pressure here is very high. So it is very similar to the high Mach number case we looked at, the strong shock. So strong shock, high Mach number cases. Very similar to that, essentially the same problem if we wanted to model it as such. So just so that we can jog your brain or memory, uh, Remember, for high Mach number limit, we had relations, the jump condition. So the rankin hugonio jump condition, for example, looks like this. So this is just an example of what you might need in order to get to uh, K. Uh, we're not we're going to omit this here now what gi taylor did so we, we know the equation that gi taylor derived the gi taylor essentially had two different cases reported so gi taylor two limiting cases so in his paper after getting his hands on on the photos, 
that was published separately, when he calculated the the size of the bomb or the energy uh, of the bomb, um, he took two assumptions. So the first one is looking at the case where you have the explosion. I'm going to do this again. So you have the massive explosion. And the assumption is inside the explosion, we have radiative heat. So heat that radiates out. So we have a loss of heat. So loss of heat via radiation. Okay, so in this case, there's obviously no, case, no way of estimating that from just photos. Um, but we can say that because the heat um, escaped through radiation, some heat, the temperature was low enough to assume gamma equals 1.4. So this means we are assuming a calorically perfect gas. In this case, it's air. So that's the assumption. And with this assumption, this assumption, G.I. Taylor calculated a K of gamma equals 1 point, sorry, that's 0 0.856. So here, gamma is 1.4, and that gives us 17 kilotons of TNT equivalent energy. So that's with this one assumption. Then we look at the second assumption, which was essentially we have the explosion. Boom. So in this case, there is no heat loss. So if there is no heat loss, T would go up. And in return, at some point, gamma would go down. And that is because of vibrational excitation. So recall in previous lectures, we have seen that as the temperature increases, so if this is gamma and this is the temperature, so let's say it's in Kelvin, so, so we'll have 500, 1000, 2000, qualitative graph here. So 1.4 for air, so this is for air, this is 1.38, 1.3, it would pretty much drop like this. So the temperature changes the degree of freedom and for vibrational excitation, gamma would drop. So here, G.I. Taylor assumes gamma to be 1.3 and then K is calculated to be 1.167, which yields an energy of 23 kilotons of TNT. So we have this value here. Now, at that time, the classified official data, official value was 20 kilotons of TNT. So G.I. Taylor, G.I. Taylor prediction 
was within plus minus 15 percent which is pretty amazing so now the question is uh, can we use this for a hypersonic case um, and the answer is yes we can use this for certain cases so if we have an object traveling at high Mach numbers, we can equate this or use the same analog of this problem to a hypersonic case. So let's see how we do this. So this is, this is the analog of explosion energy in blunt body flow. So in this case, we want to obviously find what is, um, what is similar to energy. So uh, in this case, we will replace energy, for example, with drag. But let's look at the case for, for a second. So if we have a 2D say a cylinder, and we're interested in the 2D case, this would be the shock. We have a velocity of V1. Um, so now, since we're looking at the 2D case, let's revisit the, the dimension of energy. So energy was ML squared T to the minus two. In the 2D case, it's heavily sim simplified, of course, so we can we can reduce one dimension from energy. So we can say so this would be one t to the minus two. So it's a cylindrical case. Okay, so recall that, well, if I say that this is proportional to C2TM, now C2, the dimension of it, in this case would be L to the four, T to the minus two, so this was L to the power of five in this case because we've reduced the dimension it's, it's one lower, and therefore C2 or just, just the C2 in this case can be E over rho naught, one to the, yeah, so to the power of one fourth. Okay, so in this case, if we compare, compare the equation, we will have, so in this case, if we wanted to compare it to time, then we will have m here, so it's one fourth, so it will be, so m needs to be one half. So now if we place this, we can get rid of this term here. So again, we are, if we, if we look at the dimension of it, we should go back and look at the dimension here. Um, then we have the length t to the one half there. So now if we have m half, then we'll get rid of this in this relation here. So the final quantity that we have here, or the final equation is R of T equals S of gamma energy over density, have one fourth here, and then half of T. So this will give us the radius of the shock um, 
um, as a function of these quantities here. Okay. So now, the question is, what do we do with the energy? Here, for the 2D case, we can equate that to the drag for the 2D case. Okay, so here, let's say, is equal to the drag. So we have the drag there. So the drag, in this case, um, for the geometry we're looking at, would be half rho naught u1 squared, so that's the incoming velocity, pi rb, so if this is the body, the radius is rb, squared, cd, so this is the drag coefficient, and then we have t to the one half. Okay, t to the half. Okay, so this gives us the following. If we look at the equation for the radius, And essentially, we are taking u out of the equation. So in that case, we'll have t. So out of the brackets and then placing it outside of the brackets. And u, we have a squared here. We have a quarter here. So it would be u to the one half. And then we'll have this quantity. Now, u to the u1 times t would be x. So the distance. So if we now plug that one in, we would have Okay, yeah. So x equals s and this part is x, so here we have it. So what this will provide us is the radius of the shock. So if this is the body I'm looking at, have velocity coming in, this would be the shock. If this is the distance x, then I will get, if I look at the radius, so radius here, so all the radii I will get as a function of x. Okay, so let's look at a CFD case and how that matches with the results. Okay, so here we have the equation for r of x to the radius as a function of the distance x. And here s of gamma would be essentially 1 for the geometry we chose and a gamma of 1.4. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see the shock radius as a function of t on the schematic on the top left. On the right, you can see the shock uh, radius as a function of the distance x. So this would be the shock formed by the blunt body. Now, a few things to note here. The blunt wave analogy generally works for blunt bodies with extended bodies. However, we can use the blast wave analogy for finite blunt bodies as well if we are mindful of the weight and shock structure. 
So one needs to be a little careful there. And the other aspect is the entropy layer is not addressed by the blast wave analogy. So uh, it's, it's not taken into account. That's something we need to be mindful of when we're applying the blast wave analogy. Okay, so now let's compare the results uh, from the blast wave analogy to CFD results done by Lawrence et al. So here you can see on the top figure, there is a dashed red curve. So that is the result obtained from the blast wave analogy. And you can see that the radius is underestimated by this analogy. However, the the shock angle, beta, is fairly well matched. And you can see it um, in this figure in the bottom, the shock angle beta is fairly well matched with the blast wave analogy for different Mach numbers. So uh, it does a job when it comes to predicting the, the, the angle of the shock, but not necessarily the radius. There is uh, uh, a percentage of error there that we need to keep in mind. So that would be it, and I will see you on Thursday. Thank you.